Hey guys, and welcome back to another episode of Strange Days True Crime, where we look at stories of solved and unsolved murders and disappearances. If you have a case you'd like me to cover, email me at strangedays0000 at outlook.com. And don't forget to like and subscribe and follow us on our Facebook page. Thanks and enjoy. The Strange Unsolved Disappearance of Randy Leach On July 25th of 1970, Harold and Alberta Leach welcomed a beautiful baby boy, weighing only four pounds, who they would name Randy. Randy would grow up being an only child on a 10-acre farm in Linwood, Kansas, which had a population of 377 at the time. Randy loved spending time with the animals on his farm, along with his friends and family. He also loved the outdoors and had an even bigger love for fishing. As he grew older, Randy would be on the track and field team, the basketball team, and was a senior in Linwood High School in 1988. Not only was Randy a good athlete, but he was a very bright student as well, and had plans to possibly enroll in trade school after he graduated that same year. On April 15th of 1988, a big graduation party was planned in West Bonner Springs, to which 17-year-old Randy was looking forward to attending later that night. That night, around 6.45 p.m., Randy would tell his father Harold goodbye and gave his mother Alberta a kiss on the cheek before heading out to the party. Alberta recalls that Randy was in good spirits, partly because the day before Harold had just bought Randy a new ride-on lawnmower. Randy left his home that night in his mother's 1985 Grey Dodge 600 sedan. At around 7 p.m., Randy arrived at his cousin's house and reportedly drove around till about 8.30 when Randy and a friend went to DeSoto Body Shop where Randy's graduation gift sat, a 1966 red Ford Mustang which would be all his when he graduated. Randy would stop at Stout's convenience store at approximately 9.30 where he purchased gas and two candy bars and two sodas. It was unclear if Randy was by himself or with someone at this time. It wouldn't be till about 10 p.m. that night that Randy was seen at the bonfire at the party where there were anywhere from 45 to 150 other party growers in attendance. During the party, no one had seen Randy drinking and he did not seem intoxicated, but some friends said he seemed upset and that later on that night he did seem intoxicated. It was reported that at around 1.30 in the morning, Randy was seen sitting in his car, and John Burns, who was a friend, had offered to drive Randy home as he could not find his keys. While Randy was looking for his keys, John had left the party to take some others home that had been at the party. Other partygoers had stated the last time they had seen Randy at the party was around 2.05 to 2.15 when he was standing in line waiting to use the restroom. John would return around 2.30 and both Randy and his mother's car were gone. Randy had a curfew of 12.30, so when his mother Alberta awoke at 6, she had realized that Randy was not home and had never come home. But since Randy was always so good about being home on time for his curfew, they didn't wait up for him to come home the night before. Randy's parents would search their home looking for their son, but he was nowhere to be found. So Alberta called her brother who worked as a police officer at the time at the Lawrence Police Department. He went out to the property where the party had been held only to find that the entire place had already been cleaned, leaving no sign of a party or Randy. He had stated that you wouldn't have even known that a party was there as there were no cans or cups and the ground had even been swept and raked. Randy's parents stood in their driveway waiting for Randy to show up and as they waited they noticed Steve Daughtery drive by on Highway 32 and then drive behind their home on a country road. 
Harold find this to be odd because Steve was only going 10 miles per hour, but the limit was 55 miles per hour. Upon finding out that Randy was not at the property where the party had taken place, his parents contacted the Leavenworth County Sheriff's Department to report Randy missing, only to be told they needed to wait 24 hours before they could report him missing. So as soon as the 24 hours had passed, they promptly filed a report for their missing son. Around 8.30 a.m., Randy's parents would also go to the farm where the party was, and they also noticed how clean the farm was and that they were burning stuff in the bonfire. Alberta had asked Annie, who owned the property, where Randy was, and she stated that she did not know and thought that Randy had received a ride home from one of the other boys at the party. Harold had gone out back and found her daughter Kim, asking her if she had seen Randy. Harold stated that Kim seemed pretty upset and stated that she had only seen him at the party. Once a report was filed, investigators got to work trying to find out where Randy had gone. They had spoken with Randy's friends to find out if any of them had seen him leave the party, but no one had seen him leave, only stating that they had last seen him around 2.05 to 2.15 on the morning of April 16th. Police would seek information from the public on Randy's whereabouts. Police believed that Randy had drove from the party as they could not find the car either, but it was unclear why he would leave knowing that John was coming back to the party. Later some people from the party stated that a man named Robert had Randy's keys, but they did not know how Robert came to have Randy's keys and it is unclear if the keys were ever found. The home where the party had taken place was where Annie Irwin lived, which was seven miles east of the Leach residence, and her daughter Kim was a classmate of Randy's. Not long after Randy had disappeared, the home burned down, leaving no trace of anything at all. It was determined that the cause of the fire was arson, but nothing else came of this. Rumors started to spread about what had happened to Randy, which included that Harold, Randy's father, had done something to his son, and that two weeks prior had beaten him and Randy was unable to attend school for two weeks. This rumor was untrue, and the real reason Randy was not at school was that Randy had been in a car accident and needed time to recover. A man came forward in 1988 stating that he himself had been abducted by Satanists and was held captive in a cave for a span of two weeks. The cave was a short distance from Linwood and where the party had taken place. The man claimed that during his two weeks in the cave, the men that had abducted him threatened to cut off his arm and had shown him a corpse of a man hanging, which he said was Randy. Investigators would go to the cave and search, but there was no body and no evidence to be found either. Police later determined that the man's story was just that, a story. The man was a drug user and the story stemmed from a hallucination he had had while on drugs. The entrance to the cave would later be bulldozed in. Other rumors were that someone had drugged Randy's drink which was hard to believe as party goers stated they never saw him with a drink and Randy was a tall kid and very athletic, so this did not seem like a plausible scenario. It was even rumored that Randy had witnessed a drug deal and was taken out. In 1989, Steve Daughtry, who was one of the last people to see Randy the night of the party, had contacted police to show them a severed foot in a tennis shoe on the banks of the Kansas River. Steve had said that he came across the foot while he was out for a walk. Investigators would search the area in hopes of finding more remains, but never found anything. It was later determined that the severed foot did not belong to Randy. At the time of Randy's disappearance, 
Steve was in his 30s and was living in the back of an old store in Linwood. The part of the store where Steve lived would catch on fire and burn down. Since Randy's disappearance, Steve has passed away. It later came out that it had taken the Linwood County Sheriff's Department five weeks after Randy was last seen before they had gone to the property where the party was and conducted a search. But investigators believed that Randy had not left the party on his own accord and that foul play may be involved. Strange things would begin to happen. The leeches would buy a new car and not long after they had purchased the car, it caught fire in their backyard. An investigator stated the cause of the fire was a gas line that had ruptured due to deterioration. However, the leeches believed arson was the cause of the fire to their car. Next would be Randy's German Shepherd going missing and never being found. Randy's father soon began receiving internal police reports on his son's case in his mailbox from an unknown person. Harold believed this person was an officer that was convinced the investigation into Randy's disappearance was botched. Harold and Alberta would hire private investigators to help with the search for Randy. Together they would conduct their own searches and put up flyers of Randy across Colorado and Kansas. But the investigators believed that Randy had run away, but the leeches disagreed with this theory. In 1990, Randy's parents would submit a petition asking for a formal inquisition into the disappearance of their son, but the state and local law agencies denied the request. In 1993, a man stating to be a research journalist would offer his assistance to the leeches and would spend several months interviewing people who had attended the party as well as others who may have had information on Randy's disappearance. The man went by the names of Lee Harper or Terry Martin and would pool information with the Leavenworth County Sheriff's Department detective Don Weston who was assigned to the case. Detective Weston would arrest three men in 1993 for the alleged kidnapping and murder of Randy, but they were quickly released when there was no evidence to back up these claims. After this, the research journalist, along with Detective Weston, would leave Kansas for several days stating they feared for their safety. A man who was from Topeka that had volunteered to help the leeches search for Randy was found dead along with his wife from apparent gunshot wounds and the Topeka Police Department ruled the deaths a murder-suicide. Jean and Sandy Ralston from Idaho who have helped locate more than 100 drowning victims over the course of 20 years would use their underwater camera and sonar equipment to search the Kansas River but found nothing. The leeches would spend years searching using divers, cadaver dogs, and digging in places where human remains were thought to be, with no sign of Randy or the car. In 2002, Randy's case was looked at again by the Kansas Bureau of Investigation, and they thought that Randy had been murdered. It was also at this time that Harold Leach, Randy's father, would take a polygraph test by a detective in Topeka and he would pass. Fast forward to 2010 when Harold and Alberta learned that in the 1990s investigators had a suspect named Eric Montgomery as he had testified at a trial that the FBI and the Kansas Bureau of Investigation considered him a suspect in Randy's disappearance and was a suspect in two homicides that took place in the area of Linwood. Eric would die in prison in 2010. August of 2014, the Leach's attorney filed a petition to have the files on Randy's case open. In October of 2017, Randy's parents Harold and Alberta began their civil trial lawsuit which was challenging the rejection of the request to view the law enforcement documents about their son's disappearance. 
They were requesting the records from April of 1988 to December of 1992. These documents would see if the Leavenworth County had properly investigated Randy's disappearance or not. It was believed that leads on Randy's disappearance were not properly followed. It was stated that Randy's case was still an open investigation, therefore the case had to remain sealed. Harold Leach would pass away on January 28th of 2021 at the age of 79 after he had been battling multiple health issues. He would pass with his wife Alberta by his side, but still not knowing what happened to his son Randy. Alberta believes that Harold and Randy are once more together. An age progressed photo was made of what Randy would look like in his 20s and today. In 2021, Adventures with a Purpose, which are an underground water sonar search and rescue dive team who use sonar to locate missing vehicles and possibly the missing owner of the vehicle, conducted searches at Rise Fall Pond, Sarcoxy Lake, in search of Randy's car, but turned up empty-handed. A plan to search Gardner Lake and another pond were planned, but were then put on the back burner. In 2022, Alberta, along with friends and supporters, delivered petitions to Kansas Governor Laura Kelly, asking for a task force to be created to investigate Randy's disappearance. They are still waiting. It has been 35 years since the disappearance of Randy, and not a day goes by that his mother Alberta doesn't search for him or think of him. At the time of his disappearance, Randy was a 17-year-old white male weighing around 220 pounds and 6 foot 3 inches tall with blue eyes and brown hair. He had a mole on his left ear. Randy was last seen wearing blue Levi jeans, a blue pocket t-shirt, with white socks and white low-cut sneakers. The car was a gray four-door Dodge sedan with a license plate number LVJ872. If you have any information on the disappearance of Randy Leach, please contact the Kansas Bureau of Investigation at 1-800-KS-CRIME or the Leavenworth County Sheriff's Department at 913-682-5724. There is a $30,000 reward for information leading to the whereabouts of Randy in his car. Please share and help bring Randy home. Thanks so much for watching and don't forget to like and subscribe for more stories of these strange days we live in.